what you're about to hear could be the most important message that you would ever hear in your life. I'm going to say it again. The message that I'm about to share with you could be the most important message that you would ever hear. But before I get to the message, I want to talk to you about an experience I had at a place called The Farm in Dunville. Some of you might not know what The Farm is. The Farm is a place, it's, it's a place of Christian ministry. It's almost like a church away from church. It's a place where people go to, to worship God and to receive ministry and this kind of thing. January 14th, 2013, I spoke with the, the owner of the farm, Jeremy, and he invited me over uh, to give me a tour of the place. And I went over the evening, it was actually it was late in the evening after 9, uh, 9 p.m., and uh, he, uh, he showed me the place where they have the ministry and where they do all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and we had somewhat of a, almost like a little meeting we had all together uh, amongst ourselves. Um, it wasn't an official uh, meeting I was at, but uh, it was almost like a, a, a mini meeting because uh, Jeremy had a couple of, uh, of his uh, uh, friends that, uh, that stayed with him and uh, it was, you know, the four of us. And uh, I shared, I just, you know, basically just introduced myself because I never really met Jeremy face to face before and, uh, and uh, with the, it was the first time I ever met these other two gentlemen. And uh, just briefly introduce myself, and uh, it was late at night, and um, uh, one of the gentlemen by the name of Curtis, uh, he said, you know, it's getting late, I'm getting tired, I should get to sleep, but uh, before we go, could we pray? I said, sure. And, uh, you know, we all sat down in a, in a, uh, on, on chairs in a circle kind of a formation, and we started to pray. And as we were praying, Curtis started um started speaking a word over me that was very, uh, very touching to me. And um, uh, he started saying things that was just like, uh, you know, just kind of blew me away. So I said to, uh, I just said out loud, I said, you know, I wish I had a pen and a piece of paper so I could write this stuff down. And right away, Jeremy ran and, and got a, a, a pen and a piece of paper. And this is actually the official paper that I received from Jeremy that night. And uh, with the uh, original writing on it that I just wrote on there myself. And I'm going to share with you what Curtis said. And there was another gentleman by the name of uh, Joseph there. So there was Joseph, Jeremy, Curtis, and myself. And so as we were praying, Curtis said that he saw a picture of me painting um, a local bar in a light blue color. I was working away at it. It was, it was, uh, it was taking a while, but I kept working at it. The Lord was saying that, Fruit was coming because of all my work. It was hard to see how much work I did up close, but when I stepped back, I could see much. I could see how much work was actually done. And he's and Curtis concluded that word by saying, "Visible fruit is coming for all my work." Then Joseph spoke up, and Joseph said he saw a picture of me playing baseball, and the glove just didn't fit right. I was still able to catch, but some ball, uh, some balls I was fumbling and dropping uh, because the glove was not the right fit. And it went from that picture to a picture of a glove that was the perfect fit, like a custom-made glove. And it fit just right. And Joseph went on to say, it's going to come easier now. The people that I'm around in the group, is, uh, because of them, it's going to, it's going to come easier. And he said, like Joseph in prison, it was not a waste of time, all the work I did. Because I shared a little bit of the work I did before and stuff like that. So they were talking about that kind of stuff and, you know, what I did for a day job um, previously. And he said, within four months, uh, he said just something about the, you know, the whole thing about four months from that date. Curtis spoke up again uh, immediately after that. And he said he saw a picture of me in a solid pine box. And... Uh, there was a, a lid on the box, and I was pushing up, and Satan was pushing, pushing down. And Satan doesn't like me, he said, because I am not a nominal Christian. I don't sit by the sidelines. I'm going, to, I'm going to bust out of the box like a birth. Difficult time, though there was difficult times, it was like a training ground. Because of all that, I will be like a rock. Whatever the enemy... Uh, threw at me would just bounce off uh, because of what I went through. Relentless pursuit, Curtis said. It will only come through a relentless pursuit. 
And then Jeremy spoke up. And Jeremy said that he saw a bride on an operating table and people yelling code blue. And someone grabbing, grabbing the bride and saying, wake up! Part, and he said that part of my destiny, Jeremy spoke directly to me, he said, part of my destiny and my ministry is to wake up the church. And he said, he concluded by saying that I am like the prophet Jeremiah, that I, uh, the words that I have to say, the, the ministry and the message is not going to be uh, very well liked among uh, some people. <laughs> And uh, he said, um, the last thing Jeremy said to me was that he saw uh, revelation on me, that, re that God has given me great revelation. And after receiving that prophecy, I just wrote, that, wrote it down. And, and to be honest with you, at the time, I read it at that time, it just didn't all sink in. But when I got home that night, uh, my wife asked me how it went. And uh, I started to explain what happened there, what, what the, these words that was being spoken over me, and I couldn't, I couldn't get through it. I just started weeping. And um, uh, I, the next day was uh, actually my son's birthday, and I, could, I couldn't even talk, hardly talk at all through my son's birthday because of uh, how hard this word hit me. Um, I started sharing it later with uh, other family members, and I just started weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping as I shared what this, what this word uh, was. I also met with uh, a pastor as well shortly after that, and, and as I shared with that, I didn't plan on it, but I just broke right down and just wept. And you might say, why did it speak to me so strongly? Why, why did it... Uh, why did it affect me that way? It's because, you know, much of what was said really, you know, struck a chord in my heart because, you know, I was saved in 1992 and um, even before I was saved, I started noticing things about, about the church uh, in general, um, about Christians in general that, uh, that really concerned me. Um, I did. They weren't really what I expected them to be. A lot of them weren't. You know, there was the odd one that was really a blessing, an extremely powerful blessing to me. Um, but uh, I love the church. I really love the church, and I love the church because I I have a passionate love for the Lord, and uh, you can't love the Lord without loving His people. And so. Um, Immediately after I got saved, the Lord just totally transformed my life through a dream. I was absolutely, completely transformed. Even my neighbor, my unbelieving neighbor said to me, stopped me and said to me, what happened to you? It was like a night and day difference, so I began to share the gospel. But immediately after I got saved, it was a radical salvation. It was a powerful, life-changing metamorphosis, like from a caterpillar to a butterfly kind of thing. It was awesome what I experienced back in those days. And um, immediately I had a desire to go and to share the, the salvation experience that I had with other people because I, th I thought, I didn't know that I could experience the Lord this way. I didn't know what real, you know, being what they call born again or, or transformed, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't know what that meant, you know, until I experienced it, until it just completely, completely changed my life, you know. So immediately I started, uh, I, from my own pocket, I, 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 uh, I, I, I really just did my own ministry, and uh, I ministered to thousands of people face to face. I went to the malls and I sp I talked to people randomly in the malls about Jesus, approaching them. I went on the streets. I went even door to door, uh, just to preach the gospel for no other reason, you know. Um, and no, I'm not Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I am the true Jehovah's Witness, all right? Not the Jehovah's Witnesses, but. Um, uh, anyway, I, I started counting how many people, not just for the sake of, you know, talking about it later, but, uh, I had a, I had a, you know, I had everything qu quite organized and I counted over 3000 people that I spoke to one-on-one -on -one evangelizing, preaching the gospel to them one-on-one. -on -one. That's not including all the, the, uh, the evangelistic meetings that I held in parks, in churches, in venues, 
all you know all over the area that I live in, and uh, I I I've seen a lot of things, and I I I, I uh, uh, you know I experienced a lot of things, and uh, one of the things that I experienced, and this is what people uh, my on my own self is that uh, you know once you get born again, you don't know nothing about church, you don't know nothing about what church is what what who believes what. That's the first question. What church is the right church? Everybody has their own church, and it seems like these churches are, you know, so, somewhat in competition or just in disagreement with one another. And so that's the first question is, you know, what church is the right church? And I don't know how many people I led to the Lord in the sense of, you know, leading them in a prayer, if that's what you call leading to the Lord. And uh, I brought them to the church that I was going to, and, that, and the church I was going to, I considered to be the best church in, in the area. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a powerful church that uh, that really um, had a lot of powerful ministers and you know high profile ministers that came to this church and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted everybody to experience what I experienced. You know, so I showed them videos, I brought them to church and all that kind of stuff. And you know, out of all the thousands of people that uh, that I've witnessed to, and that I've, uh, out of all the countless people, that I, uh, people that I've never even counted, of people that uh, have uh, have come forward when I did the altar call kind of thing, hardly anybody was added to the church, so to speak. And, you know, even before that, I spoke to a pastor in Alberta, and he said to me that Billy Graham, you know, Billy Graham being the most famous evangelist, of, you know, basically almost in, of, in recent times anyway, uh, that his real conversion ratio is very, 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 very small. Uh, I know he calls a lot, a lot of people come forward and that kind of thing, but I'm talking about how many people actually commit themselves to a church? How many people actually follow the Lord after that for years? And the, and the answer uh, that I've been hearing over and over again is that very, very few. And I'm going to read a, a very short little insert, insert here out of a out of a website called Roger Sherman, Roger Sherman Society .org. and this is about the uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm not really targeting Billy Graham per se, but I'm just I just want to share with you my heart and how I did a lot of evangelism, and this is basically I I, I share what Billy Graham has experienced in his ministry, and and for me I I, I kind of like sat back and like what is going on, why am I not seeing the fruit that I want to see. The sad truth is that Graham's message converts an almost infinitesimally small percentage of people who did not already consider themselves to be Christians before they heard him preach. The third result of Graham's meetings is that almost no one is added to the churches. Dr. Robert Ketchum of GARBC showed from hardcore statistics that only 13 previously unchurched people were added to the churches in San Francisco after a lengthy Billy Graham crusade. And, you know, a lot of you would say, well, 13 people, it's worth it. I would say, yeah, you know, um, absolutely. But, but let's compare, the, let, let's just say, you know, this is, I believe that the book of Acts is what the Lord wants. The Book of Acts kind of church is what the Lord wants today. I believe that we can have the book, we can experience the Book of Acts today, because the Book of Acts and everything that happened in the Book of Acts happened by the power of God, and we're not void of the power of God today. The the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is with is is still on Earth, okay, and we can still have the experiences of the Book of Acts. Now, the Book of Acts church, they had it says people added daily to the church every day. In fact, in one day, it says 3,000 people were added and baptized. Not just come forward to a, uh, an altar call, not just made a decision, not just say a prayer, but actually added to the church and baptized 3,000 in one day. This is extraordinary fruit. And how much more do we have today in, in regards to, you know, the scriptures, like back then, they didn't even have the New Testament per se. The, the stuff that was in the New Testament, you know, a lot of it wasn't even written by that time, and in whatever was written, it wasn't even canonized or considered scripture at that time. So, we have all this much more. We have all the technology, and we see so much less fruit. So, I'm saying, what is going on? What is going on? And this is what the ten checkpoints are all about. And you need to listen to this. This is very, very important for every Christian 
every church leader to hear this message, what I'm about to say. Very, very important. I have heard it said that since the year 2000, the number of mosques in America has doubled. Now, what would the Christian church be like? What would we be like? What would we be saying if we had those statistics? If we said that the amount of churches in America or in North America or in Europe or in you know, Australia or wherever or in any part of the world doubled in the past 12 years or in the past 13 years. The fact of the matter is in the past 50 years the, the attendance generally speaking, of the church is gradually dwindling constantly on a consistent basis. We're back in the 60s, back in the 50s. Church attendance was way up here. And now, in spite of the renewal and the so-called revivals and all the stuff that's happened in the past, you know, you know, 50 years, we have a dwindling attendance of the church. So this is what is alarming me. Now the question is, why go to church? Why go to church? And the, and the, and the answer, uh, unfortunately, many people go to church for the wrong reason. You know, they go to church for their children because the children like it, or because they think the children, you know, for their children because they want the, they make, they want to make the children better than they, they were, uh, or you know, for their spouse or for um, Im, you know the image of, of of just going to church. You know, they want to they want to go to church just just to look good. And although the Lord can use that in all those ways, those are not the right reasons to go to church. And this is what the 10 checkpoints is really based on, is how do you find the, the right church? But first of all, the 10 checkpoints have to be applied to you personally. You can apply them to your fellowship. You can apply them to your, your church leaders. Listen, we are called to, to hold each other accountable. I challenge you. Here's a challenge. Take, you know, take a couple hours, you know, out of your busy work week. Even take an hour, you know. Go through the Gospels. Go through the words in red. Go through the words of Jesus. And highlight everything that you've never heard preached in church. Highlight everything that you've never heard in church. And I guarantee you, it would shock you. Our churches are full of doctrine and sermons that are not the word of our Lord. You know, most most pastors, they take a, one little snippet or a few verses or even, you know, at the most a half of a chapter and, 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 and do a whole sermon on that. But, you know, what about, what about the real words in red and really digging into the words in red, digging into the words of Jesus? So do that. So highlight everything you've never heard preached in church. It'll shock you. I'm going to go into the 10 checkpoints. Now, this is what I, what I said at the beginning of the video. This is very, very important. This could be the most important message that you've ever heard. The 10 checkpoints. Before I get into the 10 checkpoints, I want to say this. If you do not believe the scriptures, if you do not want to attend a Bible-believing church or a Bible-practicing church, and if you, didn't, if you do not believe the scriptures are relevant for today, or if you don't, don't care about attending a church that reflects the book of Acts, or you put more value on the social aspect of a church as opposed to being scripturally correct, then this is not for you. You might as well <laughs> press, you might as well just uh, stop watching this video. But if you have a desire to know the Word of God. If you have, if you believe in the Word of God, this message is for you. We need to be called to personal knowledge of the Scriptures of the Lord, personally. We need to be like the men of Berea in Acts chapter 17. Today, most evangelicals consider every word of Paul to be the Word of the Lord. But the men of Berea didn't believe Paul just because of his social stature. They didn't take Paul at his word just because they, he had many degrees from, from many religious schools. But they put Paul to the test. They carefully weighed 
everything that Paul said in the light of the scriptures. They tested everything he said to make sure that it lined up with scripture. The men of Berea, Berea was never rebuked for questioning Paul and tested his and testing his doctrine. In fact, they were commended. They were held in honor. God never said that we should be we should say yes and amen to everything that's preached from the pulpit. Consider this, Paul didn't accept and stick up for the apostle Peter in all things. In fact, Paul stood up against Peter's hypocrisy, not privately, but publicly. We read in Matthew chapter 25 about the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. The foolish virgins didn't have enough oil to last all night. When they tried to get oil from the others, they were refused. Everyone needs to get their own oil. You need to get the word for yourself. Don't rely on anyone else to do it for you. You can't depend upon your pastors to supply you with oil. In the end, you will, you will have a rude awakening. Jesus said that, that you only have one father, that is God. I say you only have one pastor, the great shepherd, the great pastor. You need to get into the word for yourself. You need to study to show yourself approved, 2 Timothy 2.15. God never called you to be a puppet. And God never called you to be a yes man. God calls you to study to show yourself approved. He calls you to think for yourself. He calls you to freedom. These checkpoints are, are to be applied to any and all believers and church leaders from any denomination, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, or any other interdenominational or non-denominational church. The 10 checkpoints listed here are in no particular order. They are not listed in, in the order of importance. They are equally important. Ignoring any of these checkpoints could be detrimental. Every checkpoint is important. Don't ignore any of them. Much of the checkpoints are based upon first-hand personal experience, which is based upon the Holy Scriptures. The 10 checkpoints can, can be accurately called the 10 Thesis. The basis of the transformation of the Reformation. Consider each point carefully. Checkpoint number one. What is your testimony? Anybody who has been truly born again, made a new creature, and set free from, set free from sin can sense if this vital ingredient is missing in someone's life. You can talk all about God. You can preach all about Jesus. You can even operate in spiritual gifts, but none of, the, none of it is evidence of the most crucial ingredient, a good testimony. A testimony of transformation, regeneration, of being truly born again. Years ago, I watched an episode of The Shirley Show from Canada. On that show, she had, a, she had Pastor Peter Youngren and two atheists as her guests. Pastor, Young, Pastor Peter portrayed himself as a spiritual giant. He was the pastor of one of Canada's one of uh, one of Canada's largest churches, he had a global following. He operated in the gifts of the spirit. The phenomenon known as being slain in the spirit was evident in nearly every service, and this is something that many people looked up to Peter for. In almost every service, he would call people forward for various reasons, line them up, and run down the line, laying hands on everyone. Most of them would fall to the floor. A lot of people viewed this phenomenon as a sign that the Holy Spirit was with Peter and that he was a mighty man of God anointed of the Spirit. The atheists on the Shirley Show showed a video of, of them going down a prayer line, laying hands on people, and likewise, almost everyone fell to the floor. Their point was that Pastor Peter didn't have anything more than they did and they were hardcore unbelievers. I have also witnessed other such things such uh, where people who don't even know the Lord can operate in the gifts of the Spirit. After all, they are gifts, not proof of faith, spirituality, or salvation. This is a big lesson that I've learned. Anyone, anywhere, can receive a gift. But just because you received a gift of the Spirit does not mean you are saved. Our Lord Jesus made this very clear in Matthew seven twenty-one to 23 as members of the body of Christ, we must be exceedingly wise. No matter how many degrees a leader may have, no matter how anointed a leader is, neither earthly education nor anointing is proof of God's acceptance or approval. Consider this. In matters of education, both Jesus and his disciples were tagged as uneducated in their day. 
Neither Jesus nor his apostles attended the religious schools of their day. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every, bro and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord. Some churches place seminary graduates at a higher stature as, as the typical layperson who has, who, who has a wonderful relationship with the Lord. This is a great deception. Earthly degrees are no comparison to, earth, to heavenly knowledge and first-hand experience with God. Other churches are what I would call unionized churches. Their, their leaders have an elite clique which consists of a group of high-profile ministers which are somewhat famous within their clique or clique. These kind of fellowships are similar to a unionized company where, where there is a large, almost impenetrable wall between the union and the company, where the company are the elites and the unionized are the common folk, and there is a chasm in between them that can be, that can be almost impossible to cross. Unionized employees won't or don't unionize employees don't get promoted to company positions on a regular basis the unspoken truth is that the company often has a biased view against unionized employees often ignoring ignorantly dubbing them as unqualified likewise these kind of churches or fellowships have an, an elite clique of high profile ministers that grace the pulpit, and the common church member is usually viewed as second class. In either case, the woe can be pulled over the eyes of the multitudes, por portraying the seminary graduates or the elite clique of the high-profile ministers to be more spiritual, more holy, or more qualified than the common church member who, in many cases, knows the Lord just as much, if not more, than the famous, influential, high-profile ministers. The elite clique can be quite deceptive as they usually usually have a considerable following or they are buddies with those who do they can produce a strong delusion that they are right with god even when they are not as history has shown many of these high profile ministers fall and when they do they fall hard in the presence of the highly educated or high profile it can it can often be easily they're easy to forget the basics. Highly educated or not, high profile or not, leader of a mega church or not, the, this checkpoint still applies. Do your, do, do your church leaders have a testimony of going from darkness to light? A testimony of going from death to life? A testimony of being set free from sin? A testimony of the power of the cross? If the answer to any of these questions are no, a red flag should immediately go up. That should not be ignored. Checkpoint number two, stand against sin. Do you stand against sin? Anything that comes from God is true, and anything that comes from God is opposed to sin. This is a fact. Jesus never made anyone feel comfortable in their sins. Does your church leaders speak against sin? The Holy Scriptures, which is our final authority, a final authority, vehemently defines sin, identifies sin, and speaks against sin, from Genesis to Revelation. Should we preach against sin? Listen to how Paul preached against sin in the church. Quote, and I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. Dare any of you having a matter against us another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if, if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the, by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who, are, who is able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you to go to, to law against one another. Why do you not accept wrong? 
Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor, adul nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. This is a letter to the church, not the world. Paul warns the church that if anyone is sinning like this, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Once again, Paul says, says this to the church in Galatians chapter 5. And I quote from Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewd, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell, tell you beforehand, as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, Paul warns the church of the wrath of God, saying, quote, Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's Colossians 3, verse 5 and 6. And again, to the church in Ephesus, Paul, the apostle of grace, writes in Ephesians 5, 5, for this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor a covetous man, nor, or who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Paul preaches against sin, identifies sin, and warns people to repent. Is there any wonder why Paul said in, in Acts 25.19 that all should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance? Paul, the apostle of grace, publicly proclaimed that God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verse 3. Peter's first message on the day of Pentecost concluded with a call to repentance in Acts 2, verse 38. He condemned this, the sinful generation he lived in by saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation in Acts 2, in Acts 2 40. And again, in the very next chapter, Peter said, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's Acts 3, 19. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, Without holiness, without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. I've got an honest question for you. If you do not see the Lord, then who will you see? Being cut off from the presence of God means only one thing. Hell. God and John, the apostle of love, preached that the church should repent. In the book of in the book of Revelation, the sins of the churches are defined, identified, and proclaimed with a warning to repent, or else. The last thing the Lord told the church was to repent. He said it not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, five times times. How many times does the Lord have to say to repent? Not to the world. Not to those who are seekers. But to the church in the book of Revelation. To those churches who refused to repent, serious consequences were promised. And up to and including being cut off from the light of God altogether. John, the apostle of love, went on to say by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I quote from Revelation 21 verse 8, but the cowardly unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Should we preach against sin? Absolutely. Every prophet and every apostle did. I once shared this with a, with a certain church leader. He raised the objection that I'm trying to make everyone experience what I experienced. Yeah, I come from darkness to light. I come from death to life. I've been set free from sin by the power of the blood of Jesus. So yes, I want people to experience what I experience. The scriptures trumpet this. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Let 
everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So many people think that they are good because they believe in God, believe in Jesus, believe that he rose from the, the dead, have knowledge of the Bible, and they go to church, and they even pray. The scriptures say, you believe is one God? Good. Even the evil spirits believe and tremble. Satan believes in God. Satan believes in Jesus. Satan knows he rose from the dead. Satan knows the Bible. Satan goes to church. And Satan prays. Oh yeah. <laughs> Satan goes to church and Satan prays. There's many times throughout the scripture from Genesis to Revelation where Satan had a direct dialogue with God. And it says in Revelation he stands before the throne of God day and night. Accusing the brother. There are several times in, uh, in, in, the, in the Bible where we see Satan talk directly to God. Not only did God hear Satan, but God replied. And, and Satan heard God. So, I mean, how many Christians would love to have that kind of conversation that Satan had, or that kind of communication? Or, could I put it this way, that kind of relationship <laughs> that Satan had? But you see, it's not all about hearing from God and, and responding to God. If you hear directly from God, which very few people actually do, it takes more than head knowledge. It takes more than believing in God. It takes more than believing that Jesus died on a cross. It takes more than believing that Jesus existed. It takes more than believing that God raised him from the dead. It takes more than praying day and night. It takes more than going to church. Satan does all of these things. As Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. The scribes were the people who actually wrote and copied the scriptures. The Pharisees were considered to be the most religious, the most holy people in their country. So what does it take? It takes something that Satan could never have. It takes regeneration. It takes truly being born again. It takes going from darkness to light. It takes going from death to life. It takes being truly set free from sin by the, pl by the power of the blood of Christ. It takes being truly dead to sin and reborn alive to God in, in holiness and righteousness. It takes becoming a new creation in Christ. Those things are Satan or what Satan can never attain to. If your, if your church leaders do not preach against sin, another red flag should go up that should not be ignored. Checkpoint number three, conviction of sin. A certain church leader once told me very explicitly that the, the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin, implying that we should never do the Holy Spirit's job because uh, we should just leave it up to the Holy Spirit. Well, this sounds all fine and dandy on the surface, but when you look into the truth of the Scripture, and you, you will find something quite different. When this particular church leader said that it was the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin, he was referring to the passage in John chapter 16, verse 8. But he was willingly ignoring all the surrounding verses. The conviction of sin is not the only job of the Holy Spirit. In fact, there are eight so-called jobs. I don't like to call them jobs because I think they're more than... <laughs> it's not like the Holy Spirit's doing a job, so to say. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? It's a function of the Holy Spirit. It's what He does. But there are eight jobs of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will, one, remind you of the teachings of Jesus, two, testify of Jesus, three, convict you of sin, four, lead you into righteousness, five, reveal judgment, six, guide you into all truth, seven, glorify Jesus, and eight, reveal heavenly things. If we're not supposed to say anything to convict anyone of their sin, because that's the Holy Spirit's job, then we shouldn't remind people of the teachings of Jesus, because that's the Holy Spirit's job. And we shouldn't guide people into truth, because that's the Holy Spirit's job. And we shouldn't glorify Jesus, because that's the Holy Spirit's job. If any church leader tells you that they will not convict people of their sin, because that's the Holy Spirit's job, then when that particular pastor gets to church on Sunday morning, he or she should just sit down and just let the Holy Spirit do his job. And by no means should we sing to the Lord because it's the Holy Spirit's job to glorify Jesus, not ours. Obviously, this is all absurd. 
This is twisted theology founded on a double standard. How does the Holy Spirit do these eight things? How does the Holy Spirit remind people of the teachings of Jesus? How does the Holy Spirit testify of Jesus? How does the Holy Spirit guide people into all truth? How does the Holy Spirit glorify Jesus? How does the Holy Spirit convict people of sin? Let me tell you the truth. And this is the truth. The answer to all of these questions is by using your mouth. Remember, you cannot have genuine conversion without genuine conviction. As ministers of God, it is our God-given duty to lift up our voice against sin, just as much as it is, it is our God-given duty to lift up our voice to glorify God. Checkpoint number four, repentance. Some preachers object to preaching repent the repentance message. One pastor said that there was a street preacher who was holding up a sign conveying the, repent the message of repentance. When this man was approached uh, and asked if anyone came to the Lord, he said, not that I know of. This preacher used this argument to somehow prove that preaching repentance is not fruitful. That is a very poor argument. We should never draw conclusions based upon such a shallow judgment. Don't forget that not one, but myriads of pastors stand in their pulpits every Sunday and do not preach repentance at all. And they too have never won anybody to the Lord for years. In fact, church attendance is dwindling and countless churches are closing. Does that mean that the pastors who never preach repentance are ineffective? I live in the country and I live next to a farmer. He hires one man to sow the seed, but at harvest time he hires a different man to reap the harvest. And yes, this is biblical. One man sows and another man reaps. What do you think the sower would say if I stopped him and said, Are you, are you, are you reaping any crops? Are you seeing any fruit? If he said, not that I know of, should I write him off as being ineffective and false? It would be absurd for someone to condemn the sower for being ineffective just because he's not reaping anything. His job is to sow, not reap. Luke chapter 24, verses, 20, verses 46 to 48, Jesus said this, Thus it is written that it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should, re should be repentance should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. Every prophet and every apostle on record preached the message of repentance. The message was clear. Repent and believe. How did they preach the message of repentance? First, they clearly defined sin. A lot of people don't know what sin is. Secondly, they identified sin in the lives of nations, cities, communities, and people. Thirdly, they gave a clear call to repentance. I, I, heard, uh, I, heard, I heard one preacher say that you should preach the message of repentance only if the Holy Spirit tells you to. If the Holy Spirit tells you to, the Holy Spirit already told you to in the Bible. Someone said, that the message of repentance is not for everyone. Is the Bible for everyone? If your church leaders do not preach repentance, another red flag should go up. That should not be ignored. Checkpoint number five, support for the needy. Most Bible-believing Christians agree. The book of Acts provides us a picture of the model church. The book of Acts paints a picture of a church white hot with the Spirit of God. The Book of Acts Church had two primary branches of ministry. Number one, the ministry of the Word. Number two, the serving of tables, humanitarian work. One cannot read the scriptures without hearing God's heart concerning the poor and needy. A lot of emphasis is given to helping, to helping the poor. The Lord even identified himself with the poor, saying that if you, do, that if you give to the poor, you lend to, to the Lord. Also in Matthew chapter 25, the Lord identifies himself with the poor. He said that if you care for the poor properly, if you do not care for the poor properly, Jesus will cast you out. It is very important to get involved with a fellowship of believers who actively practice this. Do you or your church leaders actively help the poor and needy in your congregation, community, or city? 
Checkpoint number six, heaven and hell. I have spent over 20 years studying the testimonies of people who have clinically died and come back to life to talk about it. I have studied documentaries such as Death and Beyond by John Osteen and The Lazarus Phenomenon DVD to Hell and Back by Maurice Rawlings and countless personal testimonies in person, in video, and in writing. Watching the DVDs, videos regarding the books, reading the books, articles, and hearing testimonies on this subject only served to strengthen my faith. With rare exception, all of these testimonies confirm the truth of the Word of God concerning the afterlife. But for the most part, people who have come back from the dead only serve as witnesses to the truth of the Scriptures. As preachers of the Gospel, we ought to be specialists in heaven and hell. After all, that is what the true Gospel is all about. We need to know, A, who exactly goes to heaven according to the Word of God, confirmed by numerous first-hand accounts, and 2. Who exactly goes to hell according to the Word of God, confirmed by numerous first-hand accounts. A true minister of the Gospel must know this inside and out. We cannot twist the meaning of the Scriptures to make it sound nicer. We cannot misinterpret or misapply the Word of God to make it say what we want it to say to make us feel more comfortable in our politically correct, sin-friendly society. And we must never ignore the innumerable testimonies of those who had come back from the dead. If you ignore all those who testify of their first-hand experiences of hell, you are indirectly calling them liars. Don't turn a deaf ear to these people. Is, is it possible that all of these people are experiencing hallucinations? There are many testimonies of people who find themselves out of their body, who walked to other parts of the hospital and witnessed private conversations or described things in parts of the hospital that they would have no access to. Is it possible that people from all over the world who do not know each other can lie about, can lie about these things and have their stories match? Many of these people describe heaven identically. Likewise, many of these people describe hell identically. God said, let every matter be settled on the account of two or three witnesses. These witnesses testify to the truth that hell is real, that many people go there. In fact, according to Dr. Maurice Rawlings, that there are plenty of people who die, experience hell, and are resuscitated. But we never hear about it. Why? Because it's like getting an F on your report card. A lot of people would rather not talk about it. We, we need to know who goes to heaven and who doesn't. If we don't know, how can we preach the gospel? If you don't know where to clearly draw the line between those who are going to heaven and those who are going to hell, you cannot preach the true gospel. In order to tell people, in order to tell a group of people to get off the sinking ship into a lifeboat, you must know who is on the sinking ship and who is in the lifeboats with clarity and conviction in order to accurately and effectively and to be accurate and effective in your work to rescue them. I mean, if you don't know, then in all, likely, in all likelihood, people will perish. You might tell the people in the lifeboats that they, that they need to get on the ship. And you might tell people on the doomed vessel that they don't need to get in the lifeboats. If you don't know who is safe and who is not, with clarity and conviction, then you cannot effectively rescue those who are perishing. If you are not sure, step back. Let someone else help. Don't get in the way. Don't oppose it. There are too many people who misunderstand the scriptures about judging. They say, judge not lest you be judged, as if all judging is wrong. Everyone judges. Do you like some people? That is judging. Do you dislike other people? That is judging. Do you, do you say some people are Caucasian? That is judging. Do you say some people are African? That is judging. Do you disagree with anyone? That is judging. Do you agree with anyone? That is judging. Is the sky blue? That is judging. Is the grass green? That is judging. Everyone judges. Jesus never said that we should not judge. If you, if you read it, judge not lest ye be judged, in the context of Scripture, Jesus said that we should not condemn people for doing the same things that we do. That is, is hypocrisy. Jesus was merely speaking against hypocrisy. 
He wasn't telling everyone everywhere not to judge in a blanket statement. In fact, Jesus told us to judge people in, with righteous judgment in John chapter 7, verse 24. And Paul tells us to judge the brethren in certain matters, causing other, others to fall in Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus told us to beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. How can we do that if we never judge anyone as being a wolf? Jesus told us to beware of false prophets. How can we do that if we never judge anybody as being a false prophet? Judging people is part of everyone's life every day. You cannot live a day without executing judgments. Likewise, you need to know who is sinking in their sins in order to save them. If you never judge anyone as being doomed in their sins, then why would you preach the gospel to them? How can we seek and save the lost if you're too afraid to judge anyone as being lost? Gospel, ba gospel basics. We need to know who is approaching doom and who is saved. You must know both the love and the wrath of God. If you don't preach the wrath of God, then how will people know about the wrath of God? And if people don't know about the wrath of God, how are they supposed to know about their need for salvation? If you don't know who and how many are in the burning house and who or how many are out safe, then how can you be effective in saving those who are in danger? If you don't know where to draw the line between those who are sinking into hell as opposed to those who are going to heaven, then you need to step down. Let someone else preach. This is the ABCs of Scripture. This is the basics. According to the Scriptures, the true message of God is about the afterlife. And sadly, many church leaders avoid the subject. Does yours? If so, another red flag should go up that should not be ignored. Checkpoint number seven. True prophecy and what true prophets should sound like. Not long ago, I attended a church conference fe featuring a so-called prophet. I find it noteworthy that to add that this so this so-called prophet clearly said that he wasn't a prophet, but the pastor hosting the conference called him a prophet nonetheless. At the time, I was fully supportive of the conference. I even led worship at the first of a series of meetings. There was a lady whom I worked with at a day job by the name of Melissa. I invited her to the conference in which the so-called prophet was speaking. I attended a few meetings beforehand and I knew what to expect. I believed in the conference and the ability of this prophet so much that I challenged Melissa with a money-back guarantee saying that, if, that I would cover her traveling expenses if she didn't like it. And I eventually convinced Melissa to come out. Now she was, a, she was an agnostic. She wasn't an unbeliever. She wasn't a believer. She was just simply not sure what to believe. She seemed to be very open and honest. And that's why I, I invited her. Unfortunately, approximately a year before her conference, before the conference, Melissa's mother died. When Melissa went forward to receive personal prophecy, the so-called prophet told her a number of things. He concluded his prophecy by saying, something about your mother. As to be expected, when the so-called prophet said that, Melissa broke into tears. The following day at work, I, act, I asked Melissa what she thought of the meeting. She said that she thought the prophet was very generic, vague, and ambiguous, you know, considering all the other things that he said. She wasn't, she wasn't sure whether or not he was a real prophet. She, said, she went on to say that she believed that this prophet had some degree of psychic power. She explained to me that her father also died a number of years ago, and she went to a prof professional psychic and medium to hear from her father. A psychic, the psychic told Melissa that her father said, It's all good news where I am, no bad news. Melissa was shocked because when, when her father was alive, he would always complain about the media being bearers of bad news and no good news. She said he would always say that there was no good news, but only bad news. Therefore, when the psychic told her this, she believed that the psychic actually heard from her father. Melissa made it clear to me that this so, that this so-called prophet was no more accurate than the psychic. I, I told Melissa the difference between psychics and true prophets. As we know, the, the scriptures clearly say that psychics and fortune tellers operate by evil spirits, whereas true prophets operate by the spirit of the Most High God. In spite of my explanations, Melissa continued to believe that the so-called prophet was no different than a psychic. 
and that her experience at the conference was no different than a psychic consultation. The only real evidence that I, I could find in comparing a psychic to the so-called prophet was that a psychic charges money for the consultation, whereas a prophet doesn't. I met with the pastor who hosted the conference and asked him if there was a better argument that I could have used, and he could not give me a straight, clear answer. After attending nearly every meeting of that conference, I started to seriously question the accuracy and fallibility of this prophet. This prophet told my wife that she would be, uh, she would be a operating a business, operating her own business from home by the end of 2011. The prophecy did not come to pass. Upon sharing my concerns about the accuracy of, this, of the prophet, the, the pastor said that we need to do our part in, in a prophecy in order to fulfill a prophecy. But pointing a finger at one who receives the prophecy as opposed to one holding the prophet is accountable is not acceptable. Let me, let me go on by saying this. Years ago, I know of a three-year-old child who, who died, but before she died, a so-called prophet, actually a, a well-known prophet in the area, one that was highly esteemed, prophesied over that child that she would be healed and live. And I know that every prayer, every effort was made, everything was made, you know, I mean, prayer was offered until you, know, you couldn't pray no more. Do everything you could do. Doctors did everything they could do. Parents did everything they could do. Even took the child to see Benny Hinn personally, lay hands on, ben, Benny Hinn personally laid hands on this child backstage. This, this child died. And saying that it, that, that the receiver of the prophecy is to be blamed for the prophe prophecy that's not come to fulfillment is wrong. Pointing the finger at the one who receives the prophecy as opposed to holding the prophet accountable is not acceptable. This is a simple act of blame shifting. This is a simple act of blame shifting. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe this false teaching. It is not scriptural whatsoever. When conditions apply. Now, there are times when when conditions do apply to a prophecy. Conditions apply only when a condition is clearly stated or when a prophecy is regarding ju God's judgment for sin or blessings for righteousness. For example, if you receive a prophecy stating, because of your purity, your honesty, righteousness, and dedication to God, that he will elevate you to mayor of the city within five years, then God's blessings for righteousness is clearly involved. And it may be possible to change that prophecy by turning from righteousness and honesty and being li and living an evil, wicked life within those five years. But on the other hand, if you receive a prophecy stating you will die tomorrow, the Lord is angry with you because of your stubbornness and sin, then God's wrath is, is involved, and it may be possible to change that prophecy by your repentance. And I'll go on to add that I once attended a church... Um, that uh, that had a guest speaker by the name of Ed Dufresne. And Ed Dufresne shared an experience he had in Europe where he got up in the pulpit and he prophesied from the Spirit of God. He said, there's a certain pastor and if he doesn't stop speaking against another pastor, uh, man of God, anointed man of God, he's going to drop dead in his pulpit. Sure enough, that pastor got up in his pulpit, the one that he prophesied about, and he started cutting down this other pastor, this other man of God. And he dropped dead right in his pulpit. And that's what Andrew Frayne said. So that's a prophecy. <laughs> that came, that's a prophecy that I would say it came from the Word of God. That was the Word of God. And that other prophet that he prophesied against did not repent. Therefore, he paid the price. And that's scriptural. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. Scriptural. When conditions do not apply. Conditions do not apply when a prophecy is given without condition. And it clearly does not have anything to do with God's wrath on the sinner or blessings on the righteous. For example, if you receive a prophecy stating, Tomorrow a man dressed in a suit with a lady in a red dress will arrive at your place in a limo and come knock at your door, then that prophecy is without condition and does not have anything to do with God's wrath on the sinner or blessings to the righteous. It will come to pass if it is truly the word of God. When a prophet delivers a word without condition, it should be taken without condition. When a true prophecy is given, especially without an explicitly stated condition, that prophecy will come to pass no matter how much you try to stop it. There are a few times in Scripture where God said 
that he would judge a certain person or people because of their sin. The person or people repented and God changed his mind and relented. This is in line with the scripture. As repentance is a good way to divert the wrath of God. Scripture teaches this. There are a few examples in scripture where the Lord changed his mind. Case in point, Hezekiah's extension of life. But never forget that every time the Lord chooses a certain prophet to deliver a word to a person or people, and if the Lord somehow changes his mind, he always sends that same prophet back to the person to deliver the updated word before the appointed time of fulfillment. Let me say this again. Never forget that every time a, the Lord chooses a certain prophet to deliver a word to a person or a people, if, that, if the Lord somehow changes his mind, he always sends that person, that same prophet, back to the person to deliver the updated word before the appointed time of fulfillment. The Lord sends the same prophet back with an updated word of prophecy before the appointed time of the first prophecy's fulfillment for the purpose of protecting his true prophet from being judged as a false prophet. He does this because no one can judge a true, pro true prophet as being a false prophet if they come with an updated word before the aforementioned, aforementioned time of fulfillment. Prophets never do hit-and-run prophecies that never come to pass. It's unscriptural and irresponsible. That said, you cannot find one personal prophecy in Scripture that did not come to pass. In fact, the Lord said that we should judge prophets by whether or not the prophecy should come to pass as prophesied. But keep in mind that the amount of times that God changes his mind and thus changes his word to a certain person or people is very rare. It is the exception to the rule, not the rule. If the prophecy does not come to pass, the Lord is clear about this, that prophet is a false prophet and is not to be regarded. Getting back to the prophecy over my wife. It was virtually impossible for my wife to try to make this prophecy come to pass without turning her back on her family. My, we struggle to find just enough time for one another. My wife is an extremely busy woman. There is no doubt that if she worked hard to try to make this prophecy come to pass, it would ultimately result in the, it could ultimately result in the destruction of our family as we were already pushed to our limits. And even then there is no guarantee that that the prophecy would be fulfilled by the date specified. If she did turn her back on family responsibilities and devoted a considerable amount of time to try to make the prophecy come to pass, and if it didn't, I'm sure there'd be some accuser to stand up to say she didn't try hard enough. We just don't believe that the Lord would put that kind of burden on us. If he were going to give my wife a home-based business, it would have to be a miracle of God and not our doing. Furthermore, the act of blame shifting when a prophecy does not come to pass is nowhere taught in the scriptures. Nowhere. And is, for lack of a better word, criminal. It's criminal. When you prophesy over somebody, especially when you prophesy, you know, that someone's going to be healed or something like that, or, you know, you put a burden upon someone that, you should, that is false and you blame them, yes, that's criminal. It's a sin. When a person opens when a when a person opens his or her mouth and prophesies. Let me say this again. When a person opens his or her mouth and prophesies, that person should take full responsibility for what they say. It can, has and does bring reproach upon upon the name of the Lord. And let me go on to say this. The whole teaching that oh you have to practice to be, you know, to hear the word of God, you have to practice to be a good prophet, nowhere to be found in scripture. That's not scriptural. Give me one, one, one good example of one good true prophet in the Bible that, that was ever had to practice to prophesy. Unscriptural, false teaching. When a prophet delivers a prophecy in the Bible, it came to pass. No exceptions. We can look at personal prophecies that Samuel gave to Saul. Every, every prophecy came to pass without exception. Whether Saul wanted it to or not. Whether Saul did his part or not. In fact, there, were, there, was not, there was not a personal prophecy given in the Bible that did not come to pass. I told, this to a, I told this certain pastor 
that if he teaches people uh, that they are supposed to do their part in fulfilling prophecy, that he needs to draw a clear line, clear line, between what he teaches and what Abraham did. Remember, the word of God came to Abraham that he would be a father. Years passed and nothing happened. So he tried to fulfill the prophecy in his own strength. The, res the result was disastrous. It produced a wild, violent man, Ishmael. And to this day, most of the acts of terror and, and killing of Christians come from the descendants and the religion of Ishmael. God told him that Ishmael was not the fulfillment of prophecy, rather Isaac was, who was produced when least expected. Isaac was not a product of human effort. Rather, Isaac was a result of a sovereign miracle done by a sovereign God when Abraham least expected it. The story of Abraham speaks loud and clear. When you try to fulfill a prophecy in your own strength, it doesn't work. It produces, it doesn't produce, it doesn't produce the promised child. If God says it will happen, it will happen. And nothing can stop it. The word of God is not so weak that we have to help it. We can, we can go through the scriptures and speak of prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that was given to people who resisted the prophecy, yet it still came to pass. In fact, the Lord spoke to me very clearly years ago and told me that a certain thing would happen. I fought it. I fought against the word. I resisted the word. But no matter how much I resisted it, it still came to pass. That was the true word of God. God's word is not weak that it needs our help. Going back to the conference where this so-called prophet was ministering, dozens of people came, came to him during the, during the service for personal prophecy. Actually, the number of personal prophecies this man gave could have easily exceeded 100. In every case, the prophecy that was given was all blessing. No mention of sin, no mention of salvation, no mention of anyone needing to come to God, no rebukes, no conviction whatsoever. It is my understanding that that personal prophecy is supposed to be the word of the Lord. Now, when I say prophecy, a lot of people think about just the future, you know, predicting the future. That's not. It, it, it does include that, but it doesn't. That doesn't. That's not exclusively prophecy. Prophecy just means the inspired word of God. It could be a word about your past. It could be a word about your present. It could be the word about the future. Whatever. It prophecy does not necessarily mean the future. So it's my understanding that prophecy supposed to be the word of the Lord. Simple. And it's also my understanding that the Bible is supposed to be the word of the Lord. So in fact, the, the Bible or the Holy Scriptures is in fact the writing, uh, prophetic writings. The Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, not, not only has words of blessing, but also words of warning, words of conviction, and specific words against sin. The Bible is not flesh friendly. The Bible is not friendly to those who hold sin in, in their hearts. The Bible is not compatible with the sinful nature. The Bible does not go silent with people who are given to sin. Yet the words that this so-called prophet was giving was words that could easily be flesh friendly, no rebuke of sin in anyone's heart, and could easily be compatible to a life of sin. Therefore, the style of the prophet and content of the prophecies was not consistent with the word of God. For example, the prophet would say to one person, God will bless your business. To another person, God will promote you in your job. To another person, you will be exalted in your community. To another person, you will be famous, etc., etc. You know, or, you know, to another person, the Lord says he comforts you. Or another person, peace, you know, peace, comfort, healing, blessing, all that stuff. This is a stark contrast to the prophecy we see in Scripture. Figuratively speaking, the song that is sung in the Scripture is not the same song that is sung in the pulpit. The song that is sung in the Scripture, the song that is sung in the pulpit, is nice, according to the flesh. It avoids offending anybody. It makes people feel comfortable in their sin. It entertains people. It makes people feel good. It's the feel-good gospel. Whereas, the song that is sung in the Bible is very offensive. Jesus made multitudes of people white-hot with anger. In fact, they were so angry, they tried to kill him time and time again. 
A well-known and highly respected Leonard Ravenhill said, if Jesus had preached the same message, message that ministers preach today, he would never have been crucified. Nice people don't get crucified. When, when Jesus gave a personal prophecy to the woman at the well, the woman simply asked Jesus for some living water. The woman simply asked Jesus for the Holy Spirit, really. The first thing Jesus did was give her a personal prophecy about the sin in her life. He didn't say, I bless you, thank you for asking, I will never turn you away, here is the Spirit, here is the living water I, I, I spoke to you about, I love you, receive the gift, be comforted, be, be edified, here, uh, your sin is covered. He never said that. The first thing he did was point out sin in her life, clearly implying that she needs to repent first before she gets before she receives the holy gift. Bottom line, there is no record of her repenting or receiving what she asked for from Jesus. At the beginning of the year 2013, I attended a church where the pastor spent several weeks teaching about how to hear from God. He based his entire sermon series on the story of Eli and Samuel. He preached that Eli trained Samuel to hear from God. Therefore, you must be trained to hear from God. And he spent the next several weeks attempting people and, and to train people to hear from God. There's a major problem with that. Eli never trained Samuel to hear from God. That's right. Eli couldn't train Samuel to hear from God. Samuel was a young boy he, who slept in the temple before the Ark of the Covenant. Now all Israel knew that the presence of of the presence and the glory of God was on the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was God's dwelling place, as the scriptures say, He who dwells between the cherubim. And Samuel slept right there before the Ark. Samuel slept before the very God of heaven. Samuel heard a voice calling him, Samuel! Samuel! He woke up and went to Eli. I can understand why Eli initially ignored it. He probably thought that Samuel was dreaming. Go back to go back to bed, Sam. Eli said. See, Eli never heard the vo the voice of God. Eli never heard it because you know it was in a different part of the temple. God wasn't talking to Eli. Why would he hear it? Eli uh, Samuel went back to bed. Before long, Samuel heard the voice a second time. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel woke up and went back to Eli. At this point in time, I can see Eli probably was on the verge of taking it seriously, but nonetheless. Eli sent Samuel back to bed, probably thinking he was just dreaming. Finally, Samuel heard it a third time. He ran to Eli. At this point, Eli realized that it must be more than a dream. In spite of the fact that this happened during the night, Eli was inevit inevitably trying to sleep, and Eli was, was forced to assess the situation. There was only three people in the temple at the time. Samuel, Eli, and God. Besides, Samuel slept right there before the Ark, before the ark of, the, of the Covenant, before the God of, he, of, he, of Heaven, before the very presence of Almighty God, before the Ark. One plus one equals two, Eli thought in his head. If it's not Eli, and it's not just a dream, it has to be the Lord. It doesn't take much discernment to figure that out. In fact, many people who don't even know the Lord could have easily drawn that conclusion. The pastor who taught people how to hear from God asked in his sermon, how is it that Eli didn't recognize the, vo the voice of the Lord the first two times? He didn't, he didn't answer this question, but the answer is simple. Eli did not hear the voice of God. Eli did not hear the voice of the Lord. The Lord wasn't talking to Eli. He was talking to Samuel. Why would Eli hear it? The Lord didn't speak to him. There is no reason why Eli would hear it. In fact, Eli never heard the voice of God in his life. That's right. Eli never heard the voice of God. Eli was a priest, not a prophet. According to the scriptures, the Lord never spoke directly to Eli. But when the Lord wanted to talk to Eli, he sent a prophet to relay the message. Why? Because Eli was... Eli needed a prophet. He did not and could not hear the voice of the Lord directly. May the Lord or the Lord never spoke to Eli directly. 
Many charismatic leaders claim to hear from God, and they try to teach everyone else to hear from God. The scriptures are very clear that only a few people actually hear from God. There are many, many people who are personally named in the scriptures, but not all people you find mentioned in the scriptures actually heard from the Lord directly. Trying to teach someone to hear the voice of God is unscriptural. When, when you try to teach someone when you try to teach someone to prophesy, the gift of prophecy ceases to be a gift and becomes an acquired knowledge. This is what produces so many false prophets today. The, the truth is that you can teach someone to prophesy from their own spirit, but you can't teach someone to hear the voice of God. What if God never speaks directly to that person? God speaks to many people, but not always directly. The most reliable and most common way God speaks to us is by the scriptures. But nowhere in the Bible does, does it teach that God speaks, direct, speaks to everyone directly. If God spoke to everyone directly, then his voice would be a common thing and would cease to be holy. Study it. Write it down. Every name. Write down every name you find in the scriptures. Highlight the names of those who who God spoke to directly. Only a few will be highlighted. Teaching that God speaks directly to everyone puts pressure on believers to hear the voice of God. They try hard, and more often than not, they try so hard they fall into error, thinking that they hear the voice of God when in fact it's their own spirit, or another spirit. Many false prophets are out there prophesying peace, peace. Shalom, shalom, as it says in the Bible, as it says in Jeremiah, there's many false prophets prophesying from their own spirits, their own imagination, their own hearts, saying shalom, 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 meaning everything, everything blessing, all blessing, you know, you know physical, you know, you know, medical blessings, financial blessings, you know, mental blessings, everything. But there are those who are saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. They are, they are prophets who prophesy from their own imagination. They prophesy from their own heart and their own spirit, not the Spirit of God. Paul made it very clear that those who are truly born again, those who are truly his saints, are those who make up what we call the body of Christ. Paul said the body of Christ is just like our own physical bodies. Many parts each do its own job, and each part does its own job and is profitable just as it is. We don't want to ha we don't want a hand to try to be an ear or a foot to try to be a tongue. You would be a monster if every part did the same job. As Paul said, is our body one big eye? Are we all seers? Is our body one big ear? Do we all hear the voice of God? Is our body one big mouth? Do we all minister the word of God? Is our, is our body nothing but a hand? Do we all serve tables like Stephen did? Obviously, the answer is no. Each, each part does a different job, and, job is and God is pleased to have it this way. Herein is freedom. Not everyone hears from God, and that's okay. Everyone is different. Not everyone is an ear. So what does true prophecy look like? 1 Corinthians 14.24 says, But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, and he is judged of all. The word convinced here is exactly the same Greek word used in John 16 when Jesus said that we that the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict you of sin or convince you of sin. The New Living Translation conveys the Greek meaning quite accurately, saying, quote, but if all of you are prophesying, and notice it says, but if, 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 all, people, all of you are prophesying, this is just hypothetically speaking, and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. As they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring, God is truly here among you. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that all prophecies should be pointing out other people's sins and exposing their sinful hearts. 
But if out of a hundred prophecies, not one of them deals with sin, then something is terribly wrong. I should say this, if out of ten prophecies, if not one of them deals with sin, then something is terribly wrong. The scriptures say that if a sinner walks into a meeting where true prophets are, pro are operating, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say. This is the word of, the, uh, word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Checkpoint number eight, alcohol consumption. This issue was brought to my attention in a church I used to attend. From time to time, the pastor would call his congregation to a fast. This is commendable. His church is the only church I have ever attended that calls such fasts. Fasts, I should say. That is a great practice. In the past, the pastor called people to, to fast anything that they would deem as a pleasure and not as a need. Perhaps it would be... A, a certain kind of food, or perhaps it would be a media fast, such such as fasting the internet, or fasting, you know, one of your favorite social media websites, etc., etc. More recently, he was fasting what the pastor called the four C's, which was complaining, criticizing, condemning, and comparing. This pastor, like a quasi-humanist Christian, laid a blanket judgment on all criticizing, complaining, condemning, and comparing. Condemning it all as evil. But Jesus himself did all of these things. He sharply criticized certain people for their hypocrisy. He condemned them to, to hell, saying that they, they make people twice as much a son of hell as they are. He vehemently condemned people for their hypocrisy, blasphemy, and unbelief. More than that, in fact, they, he condemned entire cities. He also comp compared people to the worst, saying that the people that the people are so wicked that even Sodom and Gomorrah will condemn them in the last day. He complained how people disbelieved in spite of the miracles. He complained how evil and unbelieving some people were. This pastor would be more accurate to draw the line between holy criticism and fleshly criticism. But that's beside the point. In one of the more recent fasts, he sent, an email, he sent out an email saying that he is fasting alcohol. In the past, I have abused alcohol, and the Lord has completely set me free from the bondage of alcohol. I know myself well enough to know that if I ever slip and have one drink, that can easily lead to another, and another, and another, and I would, find, I would quickly find myself back on the road to destruction again. Alcohol is the fuel of many horrors in our culture. Broken families, physical abuse, sexual abuse, rape, murder, and all manner of evil more often than not, has its roots in alcohol. God says, that a lot of, God says a lot of things against alcohol. Alcohol was, a, was behind the sins and destruction of several people in the scriptures. God commands us not to even look, or des, look upon or desire wine, uh, look upon wine, which means desire wine, when it moves in the cup. In other words, speaking of fermentation, Proverbs 23, 31. God warns us of the destructive nature of alcohol. We can point to several people in the Bible who fell because of alcohol. And in the, in the scriptures as well, it talks a lot about wine and such like that. But you need to understand that there is no distinction in the Bible between new wine or fresh wine and old wine or fermented wine. You know, when it says wine, there's no Greek word which, which is separate from the word wine, which means grape, like, which means grape juice. You know, the, word, the, the phrase grape juice in our language is translated into a Greek word which can be retranslated wine. So you need to understand, when you read, when you see the word wine in the scriptures, don't read it as a fermented drink. It could be talking about grape juice. But about alcohol, what's more, multitudes of people in our society are struggling with alcoholism and many people are weak in this matter. Alcoholics Anonymous, the experts in this field, say the same thing in their official documents. They say people who once drank to excess, this is a quote, people who once drank to excess, they finally acknowledge that they could ha not handle alcohol and now live a new way of life without it. Many people need mentors and leaders who will morally support them and be an example to them. Many people need spiritual leaders who do not consume alcohol. Leaders they can lean on. Leaders they can support by way of, that can support them by way of example. 
They say a picture is worth a thousand words, but I say an example is worth a million words. God strictly warns us not to do anything that can cause another person to fall. Yes, it says in Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through 12 that we should not judge a brother on trivial matters. It, and it gives an example, like say your brother is a vegetarian. You know, if you should not, uh, it says, if you are not, you should not judge a brother who is. These are trivial matters. But verse 13 specifically says that we are to judge those who do anything that would cause another brother to fall. Let's read it. Quote, Let's not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this, rather, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's Romans 4, 14, verse 13. Some translations say decide, resolve, make up your mind in place of the word judge. But the Greek word here used used here is the same word that's translated judge earlier in this chapter and in many other pa passages in the scriptures. The scriptures say that we that that if we cause another to fall, we are not walking in love. It also says that if we, by example, cause another brother to fall, we are sinning against Christ. Here is what can easily happen. Here is an example. Suppose John is weak regarding alcohol. John has been dry for, for the past 10 years, then starts to attend a church where the pastor says it's okay to drink alcohol moderately, finds out that the pastor himself consumes alcohol, it says to himself, if my pastor can do it, then it must be okay. And then he, then he says, if my pastor says it's okay to do it moderately, then it must be okay with God. And he has a drink. One drink becomes two. The damnable spirit of alcoholism comes back and begins to take root once again because of his weakness. Two becomes four, and soon, soon that person falls back into destruction. And that person, that pastor rather, will be held accountable for the destruction of that soul. It is written, quote, and unquote. I'm reading from First Chronicles 8, chapter, uh, verses 9 through 13. But take heed lest any, but, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to, to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat such things that are that are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ, Christ died? But when you sin, when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth let I make, lest I make my brother to offend. The word offend here in the Old King James Version means to sin. Offend means to sin. It doesn't mean offense or to offend how we talk about it in, in this day and age, how we, use, how we talk about it in our current way of, of using that word. Romans chapter 14, verses 14 to 15 and 21 says, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing in itself is nothing is unclean in itself, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Does your church leaders drink alcohol? If the answer is yes, a red flag should go up. That should not be ignored. Checkpoint number nine, where is the cross? The cross is at the center of history. The cross is at the center of the Christian faith. The cross is the, cross is the center of the Bible. The cross is beautiful. The cross is glorious. In speaking of the cross, the scriptures say that it pleased Yahweh to bruise him, speaking of the sufferings of Christ. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, it says. The cross resonates with the pleasure of God. The cross resonates with the power of God. The message of the cross is essential to salvation. The message of the cross is virtually non-existent. 
in most of today's churches. We need the old-fashioned message of the cross. Some churches only preach the message of the cross on Good Friday. And the message that, that is preached on Good Friday is so bleak and sorrowful, it is totally unscriptural. When Peter got sorrowful over the idea of Jesus being crucified, Jesus sharply rebuked him, saying, Get behind me, Satan! You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Satan, appealing to the mind of man, portrays the cross as sorrowful and undesirable. But it pleased Yahweh to bruise the Messiah. God's view of the cross is glorious. It is a serious offense to look at the cross from, a, from the viewpoint of man. Jesus sharply rebuked Peter for doing so. As Christians, we, should, we must look at the cross from the Spirit. A place of glory, a place of joy, a place of the pleasure of God, a place where the sinful nature was crucified. Galatians 5.24 And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with, it, with its affections and lusts. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I, I, I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do your church leaders regularly preach the cross? If not... Another red flag should go up that should not be ignored. Check, check point number 10. Romans 10.9 10, There is one thing that has been resonating in my spirit for months. The warning that Jesus gave his disciples in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7.21-23 7, Jesus said that many, and when Jesus says many, he means many. Many people will come to him declaring he is Lord. Reminding him that they prophesied in his name. They even cast out demons in his name. And done many works in his name. And he will turn to them. He promised. He, he will turn to them. And, and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. And they will be cast out into outer darkness. The darkness of hell. Jesus said that many will come to him saying, Lord, Lord. In Jesus' culture, a repetitive statement was an emphatic statement. Jesus said that many will come to him emphatically declaring him to be Lord, but he will turn them away because of their iniquities, because of their sin. The word iniquity in the original Greek means having no law or living like there's no law. In other words, Jesus said many will come to him, not only declaring him to be Lord, but also prophets work and workers of miracles will come to him. And he will say, depart from me. You are a sinner. You are a worker of iniquity. You live like there's no law to live by. You live having no law. In casual conversation, I told a pastor about my conviction on this scripture. Instead of applauding the word of the Lord upon my life, he opposed it. Instead of saying, Amen, this pastor responded to me by saying, Well, you have to deal with Romans chapter 10, 10 verse 9, saying, If you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's easy. Romans 10 verse 9 should not be cut out of the Bible, ignoring all the rest of the scriptures regarding repentance and true salvation. Let's say, let's say I, sub, I submit to you a picture of a, of a sunset and you cut out a little, a cute little cloud and you turn and you say, this is a sunset. When in fact it's not. It's only part of the, of the big picture. Therefore you cannot quote Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and say this is how you're saved. The rest of the scripture should never be excluded from the big picture. Romans 10 verse 9 is only a link in the chain. It's not the be all end all. It's like saying if, if, if anyone wants to go to Hawaii you must board a plane or a ship. Well, obviously, but it takes much more than that. But there is a lot involved in planning your trip to Hawaii. Not to mention, you must pay the fare. So, you know, you must do more than confess the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead. Cutting this verse out of the Bible and, and ignoring all the rest is the damnable practice of heresy called scriptural isolation. Scriptural isolation is heresy. The same person who wrote that scripture, Paul, also preached repentance from sin in many other places in his letters. This is not to mention 
the account of the book of Acts, where repentance is clearly taught as a precursor to salvation. The meaning of a verse can be lost or misunderstood when scripture isolation is practiced. The immediate surrounding context and the rest of Paul's epistles give us a much clearer a clarity and into the truth of salvation. Cutting Romans chapter 10 verse 9 out of the Bible and using it as a recipe for salvation is not dividing the word is not rightly dividing the word of truth. It is taking it out of context, it is scriptural isolation, and more than that, it is heresy. In fact, the very next verse, Romans 10:10 10, 10, says, "For he who believes believes unto righteousness." And you cannot be righteous if you are unrepentant. You cannot manifest righteousness by your sin. Romans chapter 10, verse 10, obviously tells us of the outcome of true faith, which is righteousness. And this is not some kind of magical, invisible, imputed spiritual imagination. It is a true, real-world, provable, and practical righteousness that only comes as true as fruit of repentance. Just the way that John the Baptist preached it. Just the way that Jesus preached it. Just the way that all of the apostles preached it. We should never cut one verse out of the Bible and leave the rest behind. Paul doesn't say you must repent and believe in order to receive salvation to one person, which he did, and then turn to the next person, person and say, you, you don't have to turn from your sins, you don't have to repent, all you got to do is confess Jesus and believe God raised him from the dead. Heresy! God doesn't forgive you in your sins. He forgives you of your sins. The word forgive in the Greek means to release from bondage. God doesn't overlook your sins. He sets you free from sin. John the Baptist introduced the Son of God into the world by saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He did not say, Behold the Lamb of God who overlooks the sins of the world. He did not say, Behold the Lamb of God who excuses the sins of the world. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Some church leaders preach that the blood of Jesus covers your sin. As much as this sounds all religious and Christian-like, some of you may be shocked to realize that this is not true. This is not scripture. This is not the gospel. The blood of Jesus is not powerless. The blood of Jesus doesn't cover your sins. The blood of Jesus is powerful. The blood of Jesus cleanses your sins. The blood of Jesus, by the power of the blood of Jesus, we are set free from sin. Jesus didn't die so that we could violate, or that, so that he could violate his own attributes of holiness, righteousness, justice, and overlook your sin. God forbid. Jesus died so that you could say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Jesus died so that his people can, by faith in the cross, identify with that cross and say, I am dead to sin, and I am alive to righteousness. The scriptures say that those who are Christ have crucified their, their sinful nature with its passions and lusts. Jesus died to put an end to sin, not cover it. Jesus is not just my substitute. Jesus is my identity. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been raised with him in a newness of life.